I am such an awesome guy. I make so many videos. Boom. Hello there. Price of Reason here with a series review. For many years, as far as Star Trek goes, there hasn't been much to get excited about, especially when it comes to Star Trek TV shows. One of the main reasons for this is the poor leadership of Alex Kurtzman, who has overseen the destruction of all of Star Trek's TV properties since 2016. For those unfamiliar, Alex Kurtzman is a longtime disciple of J.J. Abrams, who himself played a key role in the destruction of both Star Trek and Star Wars franchises on film. For Kurtzman, as he once explained, Star Trek is actually a political platform where he can promote his preferred ideologies. And much like his mentor, J.J. Abrams, and their other Hollywood activist friends, he's basically a creative hack, too. This is how we ended up with a bunch of crappy Star Trek shows that nobody wants to watch. And out of these shows, quite possibly, the most insulting one has been Picard, a series that was billed as a sequel to the events of the beloved Star Trek The Next Generation. When it was first released in early 2020, I had hoped that Picard would be an instance where, in spite of Kurtzman, Star Trek fans would still get something enjoyable, and when it first came out, I had actually watched it. Well, technically, just the first few episodes of it, and then I stopped. That's because, to me, it had a very Last Jedi type of vibe to it. From what I could tell, this so-called sequel series was basically about an older Jean-Luc Picard getting yelled at and talked down to by a bunch of younger and more, uh, inspiring women. It didn't feel like Star Trek at all. I'd say that it was fan fiction, but I had actually seen Star Trek fan fiction that was significantly better. After already being burned by Kathleen Kennedy-era Star Wars, I had made a bold and unprecedented decision. Instead of continuing to suffer through Picard, I had stopped watching it altogether. For me, this was one of the best TV show decisions that I had ever made. From time to time, I'd still hear from my friends about dumb things that were happening on the show, including Picard dying and turning into a robot, and I would always feel a sense of relief that I wasn't watching this disaster. I had pretty much accepted that the Star Trek franchise, much like Robot Picard, was dead, and I had moved on. Sometime last year, after the complete failure of the first two seasons of the Picard series, and pretty much everything else Kurtzman related, there was talk of a completely new creative direction for the series. A third and final season of Picard that would feature the full cast of The Next Generation. A season that would supposedly be a fitting send-off and tribute to them, and to longtime fans. Initially, I had kind of brushed it off because I had no more faith in the franchise whatsoever. Over the past few weeks, though, leading up to the show's release, I started hearing from people that I know and trust that this new season would actually be good. In addition, I was also told that I wouldn't actually have to watch the crappy earlier seasons of the show in order to watch this one because it was something of a hard, soft reboot. That the showrunner of this season, producer Terry Metalis, was a real Star Trek fan, knew what type of show fans wanted, and was going to deliver a real Star Trek experience. This put me in a strange position for a number of reasons, but ultimately, out of sheer curiosity, and against my better judgment, I just watched Picard Season 3, Episodes 1 and 2, and this is my official review. Let's begin with a recap of the episodes. Episode 1, titled The Next Generation, starts off with Dr. Beverly Crusher under attack on a ship. Beverly locks a young man out of the room she's in and shoots some weird-looking bad guys, getting injured in the process. She then has to flee, apparently, and before she goes into warp, she sends some type of distress message to Admiral Jean-Luc Picard. Picard is spending time with his girlfriend at Chateau Picard when he hears Beverly's distress signal that she sent to an old Enterprise communicator of his. In her message, Beverly gives Picard's coordinates, says the word Hellbird, and tells him not to involve Starfleet. Picard then meets Captain William Riker at Guinan's San Francisco bar. Riker and Picard are scheduled to give elder statesman-type speeches at Starfleet Frontier Day, and after exchanging a few pleasantries, Picard shares the info from Beverly's message with Riker. Both wonder why Beverly had stopped talking to all her former colleagues 20 years ago, and then Riker is able to decipher that she's located in the Riton system outside Federation space. Since they can't officially involve Starfleet, per Beverly's request, Riker thinks of a workaround. Meanwhile, Rafi, a character I remember seeing in the first few episodes of Picard, seemed like she's buying drugs for herself. 
It turns out, though, that she's an undercover intelligence agent working for an anonymous handler within Starfleet, trying to find out about a potential terror plot. Riker comes up with a plan that he and Picard would pretend to inspect a ship called the Titan A, only to cleverly divert it to where Beverly is located. Initially, they are greeted by Seven of Nine, first officer of the Titan, now using the name Annika Hansen. Geordi LaForge's daughter is also on this ship. While Seven has a good rapport with Picard, the ship's Captain Shaw doesn't like Picard and Riker at all, talks down to them and is rightly suspicious of them. As a result, he refuses to allow them to take the ship anywhere and has them sleep on bunk beds. Luckily, while Captain Shaw is asleep, Seven decides to take Picard and Riker to where they wanted to go, and they use a shuttle to get to Beverly. Shaw realizes what Seven has done and tells her that there will be serious repercussions for disobeying his orders. Meanwhile, Rafi figures out that there is a terror attack being planned, and she goes to Starfleet recruitment only to see the entire building destroyed. Picard and Riker arrive at Beverly's ship. She is in some type of medical chamber and Riker is attacked by some younger guy. Riker neutralizes him, and then the young man says that Beverly Crusher is his mother, leaving Picard surprised as it is hinted that he could possibly be his father. Then, a big ship arrives and is ready to attack, and then the first episode ends. Episode 2 starts with a flashback showing that Beverly's son Jack is some type of rogue operative that offers unofficial medical supplies and humanitarian aid to people in need. In what seems like a standard encounter with some Fenris Rangers, it turned out that they themselves report to somebody that they've found Jack. Flash forward to present time where Picard, Riker, and Jack are facing a serious threat. The small ship they're on is heavily damaged and Picard also discovers that their target is specifically Jack. Captain Shaw realizes that they're in trouble, but he doesn't want to get involved. Seven tells him that if he doesn't save him, he will be known as the man that let two legends die. At the 11th hour, Shaw changes his mind and interferes with the enemy's ship's tractor beam, long enough so that they can all be beamed up to the Titan. It turns out that the ship they're up against is led by a Romulan called Vadic, and it's far more powerful than the Titan. Vadic offers the Titan a deal, though. If they hand over Jack within the hour, the Titan won't be destroyed. Initially, the somewhat douchey Captain Shaw wants to give them Jack, who he considers a con man and a criminal. Ultimately, though, Riker, who suspects that the kid could be Picard's son, wakes up a barely recovering Beverly to confirm it. Once Picard realizes that this is true, he effectively takes charge of the Titan, fires at the enemy ship, and attempts to flee. Meanwhile, Rafi continues to investigate the terror attack where there were many casualties, feeling guilty that she wasn't able to stop it. Her anonymous Starfleet handler tells her to stand down, but instead she goes to visit a Ferengi warlord to snoop around. The Ferengi knows that she's lying to him, and after giving him some type of drug, he prepares to kill her, when somebody arrives to save her and kill all the bad guys. That person is, of course, Worf, who confirms that he is, in fact, her handler. Also, he's clearly still a warrior, and not a pacifist, as some had initially believed. As usual, I will first go over what I liked about these episodes, and then what I didn't like. Number one, the writing. I was surprised to see that these two episodes were actually pretty well written, because everything I've seen under Kurtzman's supervision to date has been so poorly written until now. While there were a few moments with minor plot conveniences, like Picard having that old communicator next to him to hear Beverly's message, Seven being stationed on the Titan, and Worf being Raffi's handler, I was able to overlook them because at least there's an overall interesting story being told. And the best part is that the writing for these iconic characters is actually in line with the actual characters as we know them. Picard finally behaves like Picard. Riker is Riker. And it's nice to see them both on screen working together and doing something adventurous. They've even finally found something to do with Beverly Crusher, something that they never really got right in the films. The officers and crew on the Titan act and talk like professionals, and there's just this more official Star Trek feeling overall. And perhaps my favorite scene within both of these episodes was at the end of episode 2 where Picard and Beverly look at each other and he immediately knows that Jack's his son. That's called showing and not telling, which is a sign of good writing for a TV series. Picard knows Beverly so well that even after not seeing her for decades, just by the look on her face, he already knows what she's going to say, and he knows what he has to do as a result. And the audience understands all of this without one word being said by these actors, who execute this scene perfectly. Now decades ago, 
This was pretty much the standard on these type of Star Trek shows, but until now, during Kurtzman's entire era, actors have always looked and acted like they were arrogant teenagers on TikTok using dumbed down slang and acting like brats. So I guess I'm giving the show props for doing something very basic that it should have already been doing years ago and failed to do. Also, the events of these episodes unfolded nicely and logically, even if in a few instances, a bit too conveniently. Number two, the tone. Similarly to the much improved and more thoughtful writing, the tone of Picard season three is serious when it needs to be, but also balances that with some mildly playful interactions between characters at just the right moments, especially between Picard and Riker. In that sense, this really feels like a sequel series to The Next Generation, taking place many years after the events of the show and the movies. I can only hope that the tone continues in this direction, as it is not only the right one for this show, but really for the entire Star Trek franchise. Number three, the cast. I've always liked the cast of Star Trek The Next Generation, especially if I don't watch interviews with them. Just seeing Patrick Stewart and Jonathan Frakes in these iconic roles again is great. It's also nice to see Gates McFadden back as Beverly Crusher, and of course, Worf making his big entrance. Actress Jerry Ryan is, uh, pleasant, as usual, and a good addition to the cast. It even turns out that Michelle Hurd is actually a pretty decent actress, now that she's finally being utilized properly, which just goes to show you what can happen when there's somebody competent in charge. Number four, the music. Stephen Barton and Freddie Weedman, the brand new composers of the show, understand exactly what they need to do, which is also a welcome change. Music has always been crucial to any Star Trek show, and it is a key ingredient in creating just the right atmosphere. Also, hearing the theme from Star Trek The Next Generation here and there is always good, as it's probably the second best Star Trek theme after the original series. My only comment is that I would have preferred a full opening theme with the next generation music and the cast members' names after a cold open. I really think they missed an opportunity here to get people excited before every episode like during Star Trek's golden era. It's not the end of the world though and the music is overall good in the show. Finally. Number 5. Terry Metalis. One of the reasons this show isn't crappy like all the other Kurtzman Trek shows is because Kurtzman finally took a back seat creatively and gave a showrunner that actually knows what he's doing full creative control of the series. And while the series isn't perfect, and I still have plenty of issues with Kurtzman himself, which I will get to shortly, I want to at least be fair and acknowledge the work of Terry Metalis. He was given a nearly impossible task and given the circumstances, he's really exceeded my expectations. I also believe that if he was given full control of this series from day one, rather than just season three, it would have been even better than what we're seeing, because there are still things from previous seasons that he couldn't completely change or get rid of. Overall though, I don't have anything bad to say about Terry Metalis, and I can only hope that we eventually see more showrunners with this type of enthusiasm, ambition, and professionalism in Hollywood. Well, that was the good. Now let's talk about the bad. Number one, the lighting. A lot of Star Trek during the Kurtzman era has been darkly lit with boring gray colors trying to give a more gritty vibe. I suppose that in that sense, Metallus had no choice but to stick with the same approach of the first two seasons, which is why this show still isn't always very visually pleasing. The stuff that happens in space is pretty cool, including the Titan A ship, but unfortunately most of the ship's interior shots are all barely lit and usually feel like they were filmed inside of a Ukrainian nightclub. Number two, Alex Kurtzman. As you have probably seen in my video title, I called this show an annoying win and the reason I feel this way is because of Alex Kurtzman. Yes, I know he gave the reins to Terry Metalis and Metalis is doing a good job, but I just can't forget how pompous, arrogant, and disrespectful Kurtzman has been for years towards the Star Trek franchise and its fans. In many ways, Kurtzman is the Kathleen Kennedy of Star Trek, a guy who was given control over a beloved multi-billion dollar franchise only to keep failing, making excuses, and sticking his nose up in the air. If it weren't for strange Hollywood politics and agendas, if Kurtzman was working a job in the real world, he would have been fired long ago, just based on merit alone. And in many ways, what I fear is that the positive reception for Picard Season 3 will send Paramount the wrong message. Much like Star Wars, The Mandalorian probably helped Kathleen Kennedy save her job, even though it was Iger and Jon Favreau trying to clean up her mess, Alex Kurtzman is going to use Picard Season 3 to tell people how great he is. In fact, he's already doing that. After seeing the positive reception to Picard Season 3, Kurtzman told Entertainment Weekly, and I quote, 
When we started this series, we all talked about really wanting it just to be three years, feeling like we could really tell a complete story with the season you're now seeing as our endpoint. So basically, Kurtzman is now walking around Hollywood as if he's Hannibal Smith from the A-Team. He loves it when a plan comes together, and according to Kurtzman, this was of course always his plan. The problem is, in reality, this was never actually his plan at all. His plan was to act like a douche and peddle his agendas, but after running an entire multi-billion dollar franchise into the ground, he finally pivoted. Basically, he's getting props now for letting somebody else finally do his job for once. And for me, this doesn't feel like much of an overall win at all. I will watch this season of Picard because I like these iconic characters, but after that, I'm not expecting to get invested in any new Star Trek projects. At least not in the immediate future. My opinion about Alex Kurtzman hasn't changed at all, and I still believe that the sooner he is removed from overseeing the Star Trek franchise, the better. Maybe Paramount should appoint Terry Metalis as the Star Trek franchise boss. He already seems to have performed a miracle with Picard, and maybe he still has a few more tricks up his sleeve. What did you think of Picard Season 3 Episodes 1 and 2? Are they a franchise course correction, or just an anomaly in a sea of crap? Feel free to let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel, and also clicking on that wonderful notification bell. Thanks for watching, my friends. Thank you, and good day! I am such an awesome guy. I make so many videos.